Welcome to a Stuart Models Beam Engine Rebuild Part 15, fitting the steel plates on top of the column and cutting the threads. In the last episode I made a pair of steel plates to go on top of the column, drilled them and mounted them on the column just using Loctite 603. 24 hours later and it's time to tap the threads in the holes. My tap of choice is this one, this is a 2BA spiral type tap. I've used it frequently and it seems to cut very well. You will notice that the centre of the tap is much thinner than the rest, so if it breaks, I hope it breaks there. For this job, I'm going to use some of this stuff. I don't want to take any chances. This is called a Castrol Easy Tap, and it's an extreme pressure lubricant. And here I am starting the job, with a lot of the Easy Tap compound applied to the tap first. I'm very carefully starting the tap off, making sure that it's fully squared into the hole, because if it isn't, I will run into difficulties later on. Whenever you're threading a hole with a tap, the tap must be perfectly at 90 degrees to the work. If it isn't, as the tap progresses down into the hole cutting the thread, it gets more and more off centre and is likely to break. This clip shows another type of tap. After I went through with the spiral tap, I went through with this. This is called a plug tap because it doesn't have a point on and hopefully I'll be able to get right to the bottom of the hole and cut quite a deep thread. So why am I doing it this way? Why don't I just drill the holes in the steel plates clearance size for the tap? Well, to be honest, the reason for doing it this way is for the tutorial to show an alternative method rather than just drilling and plugging the top of the column. I was very concerned that the tap would wander when I was threading the hole in the top of the cast iron as it's been plugged a couple of times. So by mounting these plates on the top of the column, once the tap goes through the plate, perfectly at 90 degrees to the plate, the hole should follow suit underneath. The threaded hole in the steel plates will act as a really accurate guide to make sure the tap stays where it's supposed to be. So far so good, here's a second hole threaded. Even though I didn't show it in the video, in the second hole I also went through with the plug tap to get to the bottom of the hole. Now it's time to thread hole number three, but before I do that, what I'm going to do is clean the flutes in the tap itself. The last thing I want is a piece of metal to jam in the flutes and snap the tap off. Tapping the holes on this side was more difficult, because for maximum strength I plugged the holes using steel bolts, and it just so happens that the drilled hole positions at this side go mainly through the steel bolt. At the other side, the drilled holes in the top of the column were offset into the cast iron area. When working on small components like this, particularly threading small components like this one, you have to use a great deal of sensitivity. You need to know when to stop turning the tap, like for instance when it touches the bottom of the hole. As before in this clip, I've changed the tap for a plug tap and I've threaded the hole right down to the bottom in the cast iron part. Now I'm getting really nervous and I'm taking no chances. I'm cleaning the flutes and the spiral tap one more time because this is the last hole to tap. And if anything is going to go wrong, it's always the last bolt or the last threaded hole or the last item that you work on that becomes a disaster. So with a nice clean tap and plenty of the tapping compound, I very carefully commence the threading of the last hole in the series. Hole number four. With every one of these holes, as I start the threading operation, I move the column about to just make sure that the tap is at 90 degrees to the work. And OK, I don't have a miniature set square on there, but my eyeball tells me that it's at 90 degrees or near enough for rock and roll. Thankfully, going through with the spinal tap was a success. Now it's time to go through with the plug tap to get to the bottom of the hole. And once again, with tapping operations, it's really important to know when to stop turning the tap, like when you're at the bottom of the hole. And here's the finished job with the bolts in place. It's looking good. When I measured the top of the column and made these steel plates, I left them slightly wider than the three quarters of an inch required. That's so I can get a screwdriver blade underneath them to remove them from the column at this stage. As I finished the job, I didn't really like the mechanical principle of having the plates locked tighter to the top of the column because I got a very good and secure depth of thread down into the cast iron. And as the cast iron is plugged with steel, that should be more than strong enough to hold the bearing blocks for the beam. 
In this clip I'm drilling out the threaded holes in the plate. I'm drilling them out to 3 16 of an inch, which is a good clearance size for a 2BA bolt. And I was very pleased to see that when I drilled the holes in the metal plates using the 3 16 drill, they were in the same position exactly as they were held in the machine vise for drilling. And here's the finished job with the steel plates bolted in position on top of the column. It's time now to repaint the column. The paint got slightly damaged on the base, so I cleaned it off on the belt sander, and now I'm reapplying some etching primer. And similarly, with the steel plates bolted on top of the column, I'm using etch primer to etch prime the steel. I intend to repaint the entire column, including the top and the base, using some Great Western Railway green. But whenever I use etch primer, I always leave 24 hours before I put the top coats on. I'm using some very short 2BA bolts to hold the plates in position while I paint them. That was all I could do with the column, and now the paint's drying, I thought I'd have a quick look at reassembling the valve gear. Looking in my little box of red parts, I soon found the valve actuating crossbar, and here I fitted it in position. And to hold the operating arms in place, I'm using some thinner than normal nuts. These look a lot better, far less clumsy than full size nuts. A quick nip up with a couple of spanners and that's that job done. I don't think these parts are going anywhere. Well, other than just up and down that is. It's time to assemble the main bearings that hold the crankshaft and here they are, on top of another red box. The top caps are held to the bottom part of the bearing blocks using 6BA bolts. As I looked at the bearing blocks as I was reassembling them, I thought they would look quite nice with a couple of small glass oilers on top. These are available from a company called 21st Century Steam. As I make this video, it's currently working on a new website, but if you need any parts from 21st Century Steam, you can get them via eBay. And that's it for this episode. Things are starting to take shape now. The flywheel is loosely in position, and it's looking good. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website. Click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you will find it very easy to find other videos that you may like to watch.